March 26, 2001. That was the last time wrestling fans had the pleasure of watching an episode of WCW Monday Nitro before the organization was bought by WWE. Nitro had been a staple of Monday Night since September of 95, and though the company had been circling the drain for a while and the product was a shadow of what it once was, it was still incredibly sad to see it go. Even on its last episode, it was providing fans with memorable moments, as Booker T beat Scott Steiner to become the five-time, 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 five-time WCW champion, and Ric Flair wrestled Sting for the final time in a sentimental main event. While Nitro had been at times frustrating, perplexing, Flexing and depressing over the years, when it was good, it was great, and some of the biggest moments of the Monday Night Wars happened on it. There has been a bit of revisionist history, mainly by those who won the war, go figure. The WCW was pure wrestle crap 99% of the time, but that is simply not true, and the following should help dispel that harmful myth. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best WCW Nitro moments. Join us. Number 10, it's me, it's me, it's La Parker. When Randy Savage was booked against La Parker on the July 7th, 1997 episode of Nitro, it just seemed like a typical random match that fans of the show had come to expect to see. Given their respective statuses on the card, Savage was a solidified main eventer, Parker a little bit of novelty mid-card fun, most would have expected a routine victory for the Macho Man. This was emphasized by the fact they cut away from the WCW chairman's entrance to show a recap, while superstar Randy made a long walk to the ring flanked by NWO pal Scott Hall and Elizabeth. The bout was short and one-sided as anticipated, and Hall walked up to the commentary booth in the middle of it as Savage went for the big flying elbow to wrap things up, while the prone Parker lay there unconscious, according to the announcers. But then he got his feet up and nailed a stunned match with a diamond cutter? The man under the hood was, of course, everyone's favorite yoga dad, Diamond Dallas Page, masquerading as the skeletonized luchador. It was a great angle and an expert reveal as nobody had a clue it was DDP under there and provided a rare moment of someone getting over on the New World Order. Number 9. Sting Repels from the Rafters Sting's decision to walk out on the company following the WCW vs NWO War Games match at Fall Brawl 1996 kicked off one of the best storylines in the company's history. The Stinger went all moody after that, ditching his neon threads and colourful face paint in exchange for gothy black and white and sat about in the rafters for a while, watching on as the order continued to wreak havoc. The first time he rappelled down was an incredible moment. It happened right at the start of the January 20th, 1996 episode of Nitro. Randy Savage, who hadn't been seen on WCW TV since losing a WCW title match to Hulk Hogan at Halloween Havoc months earlier, stormed out and announced that he wasn't going anywhere until he talked to somebody with stroke. He then beat up Chavo Guerrero and Max Payne and would have likely done the same to the gaggle of goons who came out next until Sting descended from the ceiling. The sea of wrestlers and officials parted as the baseball bat clutching vigilante confronted the macho man and the two left together without a word spoken between them. A killer way to start a show and a first proper look at the new Sting. How he could be so trusting after being turned on about 57 times in the past, I will never know. Number 8. The Hitman Outsmarts the Man one of the great tragedies of Monday Night War era WCW is just how they managed to waste one of the best wrestlers in the world while he was arguably at his hottest. When Bret Hart came to WCW, he was fresh off being the victim of the Montreal Screwjob and had a ton of sympathy and fan support behind him, giving WCW plenty of options as far as angles and storylines were concerned. They failed to do just about all of them, of course, because who likes money anyway? Instead, the hitman's time in WCW is seen as a massive missed opportunity. He did have his moments, however, such as the Owen Hart tribute match, a couple of hilarious promos about El Dandy, and that time he outsmarted Bill Goldberg. It went down on the March 29th, 1999 episode of Nitro, which took place in Toronto, Canada, making Brett the de facto most popular star on the show. The excellence of execution challenged Goldberg, who said nothing but delivered his usually devastating spear in response. I say usually because on this occasion, it was the man who came off worse, as Brett stood up to reveal a steel plate hiding underneath his Maple Leafs hockey jersey. Typically, WCW didn't exactly follow up on this dynamite angle, but it made for compelling television nonetheless. 
Number 7. The First Shot in the Monday Night Wars One of the best moments in WCW Nitro history took place on the very first episode of the show. A lot was riding on the success of the first Nitro, which took place at the Mall of America in Minneapolis on September 4th, 1995, and had all the major stars like Hulk Hogan, Sting, Ric Flair, and Randy Savage appearing. Setting the tone for what was to come in the weeks, months, and years after, WCW also showed that they had one or two surprises up their sleeves and were really going for it in their ratings battle with WCW. WWE. One day after wrestling for the WWE tag team titles at a WWE house show, Lex Luger strolled down to ringside during the Sting vs. Flair match as the commentary team, including Eric Bischoff, flew into a panic at the sight of the alleged invader. The total package came out again later at the culmination of Hogan's win over Big Bubba Rogers, saving the Hulkster from a Dungeon of Doom beatdown before teasing a confrontation with Mr. Nanny himself. For a first shot in the Monday Night Wars, this was a big one, as it immediately conditioned viewers to expect the unexpected and went off the air on a real cliffhanger. Number 6. Lawn Dart Following their formation at the 1996 Bash at the Beach pay-per-view, the New World Order were just about unstoppable. Hogan, Hall and Nash run roughshod over WCW in the aftermath, doing what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. The Order are remembered as a kick-ass unit who made WCW cool and helped to keep them ahead of WWE in the ratings. You know, before they welcomed everyone from Virgil to, well, actually that's bad enough, isn't it? The episodes of Nitro immediately following Bash at the Beach showed NWO at their best and perhaps none were better than the July 29th edition where the trio took apart the WCW roster. First, they got to Arn Anderson, Marcus Bagwell and Scotty Riggs with a baseball bat and stage lights before Rey Mysterio attempted to crossbody Big Sexy and got thrown mask first into the side of a TV truck like a bloody human lawn dart. And I, like you, probably only know what a lawn dart is because of this moment. Randy Savage then attempted a rescue only to get driven away while dangling from the NWO limousine sunroof. Everything about the angle and its aftermath was game-changing television and also appeared on the same show as the first NWO paid advertisement, which gave us the debut of the NWO logo and entrance theme. Number 5. The Enforcer's Farewell a little over a year after being taken out by the NWO in that memorable backstage scene, Arn Anderson was forced to call it a day on his wrestling career. The Enforcer had been experiencing a lot of pain due to severe neck and back issues and required surgery that would end his days as an active wrestler. In a memorable and emotional scene, Anderson addressed his health and the events leading up to his decision to retire on the August 25th, 1997 episode of Nitro. Speaking from the heart, AA delivered the address slash promo as well as any in his career. This Nitro was taking place in Carolina, Horseman Territory, so Arn naturally got the respect he deserved as he said his piece while Ric Flair tried to hold it together in the background. He seamlessly and humbly parlayed his retirement announcement into another astute piece of business when he offered Kurt Hennig a spot, not just any spot, but his spot in the Four Horsemen. A time when wrestling wasn't exactly known for its tact and class, this was a refreshing and respectful way to wrap up a hell of a career. And then the New World Order did a tasteless parody the very next week because WCW, that's why. Number 4. Luger Beats Hogan Though the New World Order usually got the upper hand on their opponents and came out of almost every situation smelling like roses, they did get their comeuppance from time to time. Few would have expected it to happen to NWO leader Hulk Hogan on the August 4th, 1997 episode of Nitro, however. The Hulkster was defending his WCW title against Lex Luger in the main event of the show. This was just five days before Hulk and Lex were due to clash in the main event of the Road Wild pay-per-view, so the odds were that Hogan was walking out as champ due to some shenanigans in order to build anticipation for the event that fans actually had to cough up for. How nice then that Luger actually won the match and got a big moment out of it. As a match, it was as good as you would imagine, i.e. not very. But the sight of Luger fending off the order with his steel forearm of doom and then making Hulk cry uncle brother in the torture rack was just lovely. The moment was made that much sweeter by the WCW babyface locker room emptying out and congratulating him after a rare triumph for the good guys. And you know what? I'll give you 100 shares in Hulk Hogan's Pasta Mania if you can tell me who won the rematch at the pay-per-view. Number 3. The Bad Guy Shows Up 
After Lex Luger showed up on the debut episode, it became readily apparent that absolutely anyone could and would show up on Nitro on any given week. Former WWE Women's Champion Medusa rocking onto the Nitro set and binning the title belt? Sure, why not? Rick Rude appearing on the live Nitro the same night as he was featured on a pre-taped Raw? Simply ravishing stuff. Of all the various former WWE superstars to show up in WCW during the Monday Night Wars, however, none had the same impact as Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. The former Razor Ramon and Diesel's contracts expired in the spring of 1996, and they headed down south to disrupt WCW programming as invading forces being sent from the competition. The bad guy was the first to show up, walking through the crowd in stylish double denim during a nothing match between two losers, hopping the barricade and informing everyone watching, including billionaire Ted, that they were going to get a war. This worked because it was totally unexpected, and since this was 1996 and the internet hadn't yet ruined wrestling for everyone, nobody was really clued up as to Hall's contractual status. His best buddy from up north joined him two weeks later, sowing the seeds for the formation of the New World Order. Order. Number 2. Goldberg Beats Hogan Seeing Hogan lose the world title on Nitro is so nice, we just had to put it twice. The circumstances surrounding him dropping the strap to Goldberg on the July 6th, 1998 episode of Nitro were a lot different to when he lost it to Lex the year before, however. The rookie had been on an unprecedented run since debuting, steamrolling through the competition, and getting seriously over in the process. Goldberg was a unique phenomenon, a lightning in a bottle situation that WCW simply had to capitalize on. Though they may have forewent a gazillion dollars in pay-per-view revenue by putting the match on free TV, the company booked Goldberg against Hogan on Nitro in a WCW title match. And not just any Nitro either, but one emanating from a sold-out Georgia Dome. 40,000 plus were on hand to watch the former Atlanta Falcon wrestle the biggest match of his young career. As a contest, it wasn't going to win any Match of the Year awards, but nobody cares or should care about technique and finesse when there's this much star power and heat involved. Follow Following interference from DDP and basketball player Karl Malone to counteract Kurt Hennig at ringside, Goldberg blasted a distracted Hogan with his spear-jackhammer combination to become WCW champion to a monstrous ovation. And you know what? We still love seeing him winning world titles these days, don't we guys? Um, guys? Number 1. Fire me! I'm already fired! Despite being one of the best wrestling groups ever and still adored by wrestling fans, the Four Horsemen were noticeably phased out during the Monday Night Wars. Eric Bischoff felt as though the stable were passé and that Flair in particular ought to be nowhere near the main event scene. The two fell out in 1998 and the Nature Boy disappeared for months as threats of lawsuits flew back and forth. In the end, Flair would come back to WCW. And how? Once again, this Nitro took place in Carolina, so to say he was greeted warmly is like saying he liked a cocktail or 16, one for each world title reign, you know? The dirtiest player in the game, with a tear in his eye, embraced his fellow horseman and cut an impassioned promo, thanking the fans for sticking with him before turning his attentions to his boss and absolutely roasting him with the kind of delivery that can only come from the heart. Fire me! I'm already fired! Woo! Sorry, got a bit carried away there, which isn't hard when you're watching something as raw and genuine as this. For my money, the best moment in WCW Nitro history. And also a really welcome palate cleanser on a show also containing the Ultimate Warrior, Drunk Scott Hall, and Van Hammer.